All right. Keep your finger here in John chapter 8. We're coming right back to it. Flip, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter number 1. We're going to be taking a break from the prophecy series. We're going to be getting right back into it next week. But um, recent events have, have caused me to preach the sermon I'm going to preach tonight. And I think it's a very important topic and, um, and one that, that hopefully everyone here will be edified by and learn from this evening. And what I'm going to be preaching about tonight is identifying false prophets. How to identify false prophets. Now, um, I've preached sermons like this in the past once or twice, and um, I've identified people who are relatively popular, but in my opinion, seem to be very easy to identify as false prophets. So what, what I would consider someone to be an easy identifier as a false prophet is someone like Benny Hinn. Okay, someone, you know, these real charismatic, these hyper charismatic people that are, you know, putting on a big show and, and get, gathering people after them or, or people who come and claim to be like the second coming of Jesus Christ, right? Those are false prophets and I, have, I, I consider those to be very easily identifiable. But the ones I'm going to be preaching about tonight are a little bit more difficult to spot. They're more like the Judases, the Judas Iscariots, right? Jesus Christ said that, that Judas was a devil from the beginning. He knew the 12 that he chose. He knew Judas was the traitor and he still, you know, got him along. But see, the thing is, none of the disciples knew that Judas was the traitor. Even the very night when he told them, like, you know, whosoever I give the sop to after I've dipped it, the same as he, right? He answers the question, like, who is it, Lord? They still didn't get it. They still didn't even know who the traitor was. Okay, so these are, and this is where the term, the, the wolves in sheep's clothing comes from in the Bible. There's a lot of scripture. You know, we're going to go over a lot of uh, different scriptures about that. And the reason why it's a wolf in sheep's clothing is because they put the sheep's clothing on to make it look like they're like everybody else. But inwardly, they're ravening wolves and they're looking to destroy. They're against God. They're against Jesus Christ. But they'll put on that outward appearance as though, hey, I'm just like you. I'm a sheep. I'm a follower, right? And, and they look to, to lead people astray and, and, to, and to take people away from the faith. These are the people in, um, and we're going to get there for um, 2 Peter chapter 2 and in the book of Jude. Both of those chapters I mean, are all about false prophets. And they give very good descriptions of who they are. And it tells you that they, they crept in unawares. So these are people that come up and, and are going to be part of the church, but then they're going to come out with their false doctrines and deceits and try to, to take people away and follow after them and split churches and do all kinds of destructive work. This is what the false prophet does. Now, even the Apostle Paul had written, and I don't remember the exact reference at the moment, he said that, uh, you know, after my departure, grievous wolves are going to come in and, and try to split you guys up. They're going you know, to try to destroy the flock. And that's why he's warning them and saying, look, I need to tell you about this. I've been warning you day and night with tears, like, beware of these people. Look out for this because it's going to happen. And what we don't want to do and what, what tends to happen sometimes in churches, just in general, is that, Church becomes this, uh, this safe space, and it should be. Like, I mean, it should be a place where you could be comfortable with people, right? You think about church, people who love God, they want to serve God as just being a place of just total safety. Unfortunately, that's not true. I mean, it should be. Ideally, that's the way it should be. If everybody's heart was right with God, it would be. But there are wolves, there are predators, and they come in among the flock, and we don't always know when they're going to be around, or even necessarily who they are, right? Especially for a while. They want to keep their cover for a long time because they want to establish credibility with people before they eventually make their true self known. You know, the, 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 when in reference to, to other false prophets that came out, it says, the Bible says that they, they came out from us, but they were not of us. They weren't, because had they been of us, they would have continued in the doctrine. But see, they came out and started showing, oh, hey, they start preaching these other doctrines and these things that, that weren't taught, things that, they, that weren't being received by, you know, from, the, from, the, prop, from the apostles and, you know, and, and the, uh, the men of God. These new strange doctrines were coming out and trying to, people just trying to draw away disciples after themselves. Now, the reason why I have you turn here, keep your finger in John 8, to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 is because right off the bat, though, we need to understand that 
you know, this isn't something to take lightly. And it's also not something we just go around accusing people just of being false prophets, just willy-nilly and just, and just unfounded. It needs to be very, it's a very serious accusation if you're going to even call someone a false prophet. And the way a false prophet is defined in like Jude in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, I mean, these people are reprobates. These people are, are just damned and they're children of the devil. There is what you might call a false prophet if someone teaching like a false gospel, someone wrapped up in another religion, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're a false prophet that I'm talking about in 2 Peter 2 and Jude, okay? And the, the, way, the best way to understand this is the, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. He, pre, he believed in a false religion. He believed in a works-based religion. He was zealous in his religion he, he tried to attain, you know, a high status and really believed in his religion. He believed what he was doing was right. And, and he actually persecuted the church of God. He fought against the believers. He fought against the saints. Okay. So we need to be very careful, but he was not a false prophet. And the definition that, that I'm referring to here of, of a false prophet being someone who's a child of the devil, someone who's going in and, and um, whose heart is just completely darkened and he's, and he's just, you know, um, all the, all the, the listing in, in, in Jude and 2 Peter 2, you know, raging, you know, waves of the sea foaming out their own shame and, and um, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. You know, people have blasphemed the Holy Ghost things like that, 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 that have never forgiveness. That was not the Apostle Paul. And this is why I say we have to be careful. The Bible says, and, and the Apostle Paul explains this to, uh, just about himself in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Um, look at verse number 12. The Bible says, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. These are the things he did. He said, I was blaspheming the name of the Lord. I was persecuting people and I was injured, like, like causing injury unto other people. He says, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Basically, he really didn't know. He didn't know any better. There's a difference between people who know the gospel, who know the truth and completely reject it and just go off and teach their own thing and, and, and teach people to follow after these devilish religions, right? People who have the knowledge and reject it is different than the person who has just got sucked into a, a false religion and is zealous about their religion and is, and is teaching in their religion, but just needs to hear the truth so they can get saved. Very important distinction. This is why I say we don't want to throw around these terms loosely because people can be very zealous in what they believe and be in a fault you know a catholic priest for example could be someone who just got was born into that religion and they believed that and they just never really heard the gospel and this is just what they were doing and they think they're doing the right thing and they think they're serving god but then someone comes along and 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 gives them the truth and gives you know Oh, this whole time I've been preaching a false gospel and people have been believing me and I'm telling people they have to work for their salvation and sending souls to hell. Now I've got the truth. Oh, okay, and they can be converted and they can believe. But then, like I said, there's others that they know the truth. They know the way of the Lord. They know what Christ did for them. They understand the, the, the plan of salvation and they've rejected it. And those are the people that become the false prophets. And these are the people, go back if you would to John chapter 8, many of which Jesus is speaking to in John chapter 8. John, I love John chapter 8, it's awesome. John chapter 8, there's multiple times where Jesus Christ says, you know, that if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And he's, he's basically proclaiming his deity. He is the I am. This is why they wanted to stone him at the end of the chapter because he says, before uh, Abraham was, I am. You remember uh, Moses 
when he asked, you know, he saw the burning bush and he said, hey, well, who should I say sent me when I go to the children of Israel, you know, and, and, and I'm supposed to lead them out and, and help them out? Who should I say? Who am I speaking to? God, what's your name? He said, I am that I am. He said, you tell them that I am that sent you. And that's why it's so important here in John chapter 8, Jesus was saying, I am. If you believe not, I am he. Who's he? God, that I am. Then you're going to die in your sins. And this is extremely important. And um, he's explaining this to these people here. And, um, and they're not receiving it at all. And they even say like, say we not well that you're a Samaritan and you have a devil? Which is exactly what blaspheming the Holy Ghost was defined as in, uh, in the book of Matthew, I believe, where he says that, where he says that um, they, were, they were saying that you, you cast out devils by the prince of the devils, even by Beelzebub. And then he says, then he goes into, right after they say that, says, you know, whosoever says a word against, you know, the son of man or whatever, hath forgiveness, but whosoever blasphemes the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, neither in this world, not in the, neither in the world to come. He's saying, you do that, you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you've gone too far, you've crossed the line, you never have forgiveness. You're damned forever. And this is what, what the people did that were saying that basically, they saw the miracles, they saw everything that Jesus was doing, they heard his preaching, everything was of God, undeniably, yet they still said, you know what, that's not God, you're of the devil. Which is, I mean, it's almost mind-blowing to think that someone can believe that about Jesus Christ. The exact opposite of who he was saying, you're of the devil. Anyways, but that's what, that's what was going on. And this is what they're saying to him here. And we know that it was mainly, chiefly the Pharisees that were plotting against him, trying to take his life, and were doing everything they could to destroy Jesus Christ. And what we're going to see here is he, as he's speaking with them, is he's calling them a bunch of liars. So the sermon, what, we're, what I'm going to try to do is give you some um, tips on being able to spot a false prophet, being able to identify, hey, who is a false prophet? Now, some of these things, you're going to need more than one attribute that I'm listing here to really kind of to cement this down. And so like my first attribute here of false prophet is that they're liars, right? Well, everybody's a liar to some, you know, at some point. We've all told lies before. But false prophets are extremely deceptive and plan out to deceive people and are liars. And this is, you know, we'll see how Jesus' interaction with these people and he's calling them liars and of the devil. Saying, you're of your father, the devil. Again, one more, just one more point regarding that. Just as much as we, when, when someone is a child of the devil, they're not just a, a regular lost person. The same way that when you're a child of God, you become God's child, you're born again, you're born into God's family, you have eternal life, it's something that lasts forever, you're eternally secure being God's child. Well, when you become a child of the devil, you are proselytized to become a child of the devil. You've rejected God. You've, re you've become reprobate or rejected. These people have no hope. Okay? And that's, that's the other end of the spectrum there. So the, the phrase being a child of the devil is not used loosely in the Bible. People may think, oh, you're unsaved, you're a child of the devil. That's not necessarily true at all. That's probably not the case. People who are unsaved are not just automatically children of the devil. They're just unsaved. They need to be born again. They need to hear the gospel. But when you actually become a child of the devil, it's like, it's like you're born again unto death instead of born again unto life. But we're going to pick up reading here in verse number 43. Because the false prophets, they're extremely deceptive. They're going to use half-truths. They're going to use very faulty logic, and they're going to use appeals to emotion. Look at verse number 43. The Bible says, Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Jesus Christ, he keeps going over and over, explaining to him, look, you can't even understand what I'm saying to you. And this is the same for any lost person. The Bible says that, that, the, that God's word is spiritually discerned, that the natural man cannot receive the things of God and they can't understand them. And that's why any of you, if you've been saved a little bit later in life, maybe you tried reading the Bible before you got saved and you're like, 
I know it was the same for me. I have no idea what this book says. We go out sewing, talk to people all the time that are not saved. They say, yeah, you know, I've read the Bible before, but I just, I mean, I don't really, I don't really understand it at all. It's because the natural man can't receive these things. It's, it's, it's just the, the blinders are on. They can't comprehend it. It's, it's the most amazing thing in the world because no other book is like that. It's the book that God has given us. And that in itself is wonderful because you know what I'm talking about. If you're saved today and you've tried reading the Bible before you got saved and then you read the Bible after you got saved, it's like, That's right. wow, this is incredible. This is amazing. So um, he's speaking to these people here and saying, look, you can't understand. You can't even understand what I'm saying. You can't hear my words. And he says in verse 44, ye are of your father, the devil. Your dad is the devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And he's saying, you're children of your, de of your father, the devil. The devil is a liar. He's a father of lies. And you're a bunch of liars. And he says in verse 45, and because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Because I tell you, he's saying, just for the fact that I'm telling you the truth right now, you don't believe me because there is no truth in them. They are of their father, the devil. They are just a bunch of liars. Verse number 46, which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. He's saying, if you're of God, you're going to hear God's words. And, and look, this is a test that I use for people, not just for false prophets, but like even just people who are saved, knowing that the natural man cannot receive the things of God. It's difficult, you know, and look, the whole purpose of us trying to determine if someone's saved is because we want to know if we need to keep giving them the gospel, right? I mean, we're trying to give people the gospel and what I do, because sometimes someone might give you the right answer and say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, Right? But oftentimes, that's such an easy answer. Their heart isn't necessarily, they, they might not have even understood the gift of salvation and somehow they think that maybe they could lose it somehow or, or they have to do some good work still and they're not, they haven't ever really put all of their faith in Jesus. But they might give you a right answer at some point. Just say, oh yeah, by grace through faith and not of works. Because you hear it preached a lot. I mean, a lot of churches will say that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that in, their, in a person's heart, they actually have trusted in that for their salvation. Right. So what, what I'll often do, and I've done this with relatives and other people, we'll just talk about other Bible things. And I'll show them, hey, look, here's what the scripture, here's what the Bible says about this subject, about that subject, and go over this stuff. And if everything's just going over their head and they're just like not even getting it and just not receiving it at all, I start to think, is this person even saved? Because the simple concepts of the Bible, and I'm not even talking about anything real deep. We're not going into eschatology. We're not going into, you know, even though I don't think that's very deep, but, you know, just things that can confuse people, just sticking with some of the basics and be like, I mean, like creation. The Bible just says here that the fact that there was a flood, a worldwide flood, and like you try to show people, like, look at what the Bible says. I mean, you either believe it or you don't. But they just, they just can't grasp this stuff. And they're making excuses and not really believing, you know, that's someone I would say, are you even saved? It's a good indicator. It's something that you could use. And then, and then when you hear that, obviously, with, a, with just your average unsaved person, hey, let's try to bring the gospel back up and try to explain it to them more thoroughly to figure out where are they not getting it. But definitely with the false prophet, they're not of God, so they don't hear God's words. They're not going to understand these things. So you understand, you know, a lot of times there are people that, have confronted false prophets and they try to explain something to them and, and try to do it the right way and humbly, you know, as far as if this person was like a, you know, a pastor of a church or something and um, try to be humble about it and explain it and they're just like, don't even get it. Why? Because they can't receive the word of God. Verse number, jump down to verse number 54 here. The Bible says, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. The false prophets are going to claim God. They're going to claim the Lord. They're going to claim Jesus Christ. They're going to claim his name. They say, look, he's the one that you say he's your God. But he's not. That's what he says in verse 55. Yet you have not known him. So you claim he's your God, but you have not known him. But I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like you. Like unto you. 
but I know him and keep his saying. So the first attribute, the first sign, the first thing that we can look for in false prophets are people who are just liars, full of lies, that, that just everything they say is, is basically they're just lying. They're being deceptive. And not just lying, one of the things I've noticed, you've got to watch out for the guy that handles the word of God deceitfully. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the announcements, how unfortunately most Christians, most people professing Christians, have not even read their Bible through cover to cover once. The big problem with that is that they go into churches and they listen to what the, the, the preacher is saying and they just believe what he's saying because they don't know any better because they haven't even read it for themselves. And they think, oh yeah, here's the expert, right? We all want to rely on experts. And it's not always necessarily a bad thing, but like it's easy to get deceived if you don't have knowledge in the area. Let's say you're not an expert. You don't know anything about how, vehicle, how cars work. Well, you're gonna, if your car is breaking down, you're having a problem with it, you're going to bring it to the expert, right? Someone who deals with that all the time. Someone who's going to be able to know how to fix it. And you're relying on them to give you good information. Now, is every mechanic a good person? No. Are a lot of them, the majority of them probably are, right? I mean, I know they get a bad rap, but <laughs> by and large, I would guess, I mean, maybe it's just a guess, but I would say, you know, the majority of them are probably honest and doing their best to, to fix your problem. But are there, there shady people out there that are looking to try to deceive you and, and steal your money? Absolutely. And it's like that in any industry. So when you are ignorant of something, because you just don't know, it's a lot easier to be taken advantage of. And when you don't know your Bible, and when you're not reading your Bible, and you're just completely relying on someone else to just tell you what you should believe, it's very easy to be deceived. Very easy to be deceived. And this is the importance of, look, read for yourself. But so that's the first step. I mean, that, that's where you need to be ready. But when, and, you know, if you don't even have that, you're not going to be able to find, figure out a false prophet. You're not going to be able to identify anyone who's a false prophet unless, unless you're doing the reading on your own. Because otherwise you have nothing to gauge what they're saying against at all. But let's just say, yeah, okay, I'm past that. I've read the Bible. I read my Bible. I stay up with it. I mean, I, I could generally say I, I, I have a good idea of what the Bible says, right? I mean, you don't have to have everything memorized, but, you know, you read the Bible. You're, you're keeping up with it. Watch out for the guy that handles the word of God deceitfully. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4.1 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. See, a good steward, a good minister of God's word, a good preacher, a good pastor is going to have the same attitude that the Apostle Paul had in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, saying, look, we've renounced dishonesty, the hidden things of dishonesty, of being liars. We don't walk in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. And this is something everyone can relate to, someone who's handled the word of God deceitfully. And again, it's another example I used at the door saying, you know, if, if you want to, you could come up with all kinds of crazy doctrines and, and use Bible verses to do it. Rip out different verses out of context and say, oh, look at this and look at this and look at this and go on this rabbit trail to try to teach a false doctrine. I mean, people do it all the time. There's, there's tons of false doctrine out there in the world. But in order to, to, to teach a false doctrine, the word of God has to be handled deceitfully. And we need to be aware of this. And this is another telltale sign of a false prophet. Because what they're doing is intentionally trying to teach you something that's false because they don't have the truth in them. But they're intentionally doing things to make you believe something that's just not true. And they know what they're doing is not right. But they're wolves and they're out to destroy and these are the people we need to watch out for. Now, the, the, the whole point, the, what, what prompted me to even preach the sermon tonight was this event that happened recently by a man named Sam Gipp. Some of you may or may not be familiar with him. 
He's a pretty popular independent fundamental Baptist. They call him, I guess, an evangelist. What he does is he travels around through different churches. People, you know, have him come and preach. And that's all he does is he travels around to churches and um, he's preaching almost every week of the year. Churches invite him in. And one of his big things that he's known for, as far as I'm aware, I mean, I don't follow the guy or anything, but he has a lot of material out there in the King James Bible. Being the Word of God, being this is, you know, this is why we're King James only and everything. So he promotes all of this material and he gets a lot of people sucked in because of that. And I'll just, just say this now, this is later in my notes, but I'll say this right now. Beware of people that might have the same belief in, as you on, on one area, on one topic. Like, for example, the Bible issue. Say, yeah, this is the Word of God. You have a tendency to think, well, it's already such a small group of people that are just like, we're King James only, right? I mean, that's, that's not the majority of Christianity by any means. It's a small subset of people who are professing Christians to say, no, we are standing on this. So you have a tendency to think, wow, if you're part of this group of people that believe this, then you, we probably believe the same in, in just about every, you know, oh, you're a Baptist, you're independent, you believe the King James Bible, so you let your guard down, or often, a lot of people do, they let, they let their guard down and just start listening to everything else that they have without doing proper judgment and discernment about what they're preaching. Because you're, you're too comfortable with, oh, they already have done this. We need to, to, you know, so look, if you find someone's King James only, yeah, go ahead, start listening to other stuff that they have. I mean, it's a good sign, right? But don't just be willing to accept everything they say as if they're not a false prophet, because they very well might be. Everything that, that people say, everything that I say needs to be gauged and judged. It all does. I mean, that's, that's how you keep yourself from falling into false doctrines. So what this guy did, if you know him or not, it doesn't even matter. That's not the point. I'm not worried about the people in this church getting sucked into his, his stuff and his teachings and stuff. It really isn't. But when all this stuff got, got, was getting exposed, I was looking at this guy. I was listening to what he was saying, and it was just mind-blowing. The amount, one, the amount of lies that came out of this guy's mouth. I mean, his, almost every breath was a lie. He was speaking about someone that I know personally, my former pastor, that I know firsthand accounts that everything that he was saying was false because I've been in that church for seven years from almost since its inception. And I know firsthand being there of all the things that happened that transpired, all the things that he was talking about and lying about. I know for a fact that the guy is nothing but a fat liar, that Sam Gibb. I know this. And he's out there running his mouth and just spreading lies. Now, that alone, someone could be a liar. They could just not like someone and just lie and, and try to defame them. That alone doesn't say he's a false prophet, but it's a very good indicator. We've already seen Jesus' discussion with the Pharisees and that, you know, they were children of the devil and, and they have no truth in them. But look at, this is what he did, and this is why I'm so confident that this man is just out to deceive. You're in Matthew chapter 1. He taught this strange doctrine. And when I say strange, you're going to, I mean, if you haven't heard this, it might just blow you away because it's very strange. He started off telling this story <laughs> that's completely fabricated of what was going on in heaven. Okay? And it was this conversation, and forgive me if I don't get it, you know, verbatim. Okay? I didn't memorize everything that this story was, but Here's the gist of what he was saying is that Jesus was up in heaven explaining to an angel that what he was going to do, that he was going to go and be the Messiah and, and, you know, and, and set up his kingdom and rule down there. And he was getting ready to go because Mary's about to have, about to give birth. And he's saying like, oh man, I got to get down there. And he's, he keeps looking at the time like, like, well, in one minute and in 30 seconds, you know, she's going to give birth. And then the angel says, well, what if they don't receive you? As if, like, he never thought about that before. Oh, man, we're going to have to change everything. We're going to have to do, oh, I don't know, what am I going to do? And it's like, he's talking about, like, Jesus is going to go down and be, in the, be born, like, the, at the birth, with, like, like, as if he wasn't already in the womb prior to that. I mean, it's, it's so bizarre. 
That's just the beginning part. I mean, that's like, okay, this guy's got some really weird thoughts about what was going on, you know, just making stuff up that's not in the Bible at all. First of all, just nowhere found in Scripture. But what he was saying is that, and this is the, this is the false teaching, and, and look, anyone who's, who's, who's preached a sermon before ought to know that you put in a lot of time and effort into what you're preparing, the notes that you take. I, I've got my notes right here. I put time into making sure that the things that I'm going to say are right, are accurate. Because look, I'm trying to persuade you on things and teach you on things, so I better have the evidence and the scriptures lined up so I can show you, hey, look at this passage, look at this passage. This is what we're learning today. And, and I've looked at these, and I got to make sure that what I'm using is in context correct, that I'm not just yanking something out of context. Because if I am, I can't use that. I can't just use the Bible to support something I believe. I have to believe what's supported in the Bible. Amen. It's not my own opinions I'm just trying to force into the Bible and just, just say, well, I'm just going to use this verse because it just supports what I believe, even though it's not what the Bible's saying at all. And people that do that are using the word of God deceitfully. And that is exactly what this man did. And what he was teaching, and again, I'm not quoting him verbatim, because it doesn't matter. You could, you, if you're really interested, you could check out, the, it's all online. You can see what, what, what he said. But what he was teaching was that Jesus was supposed to be named Emmanuel, meaning God with us that that was supposed to be his name, but that Joseph, and Joseph decided to call him Jesus, which means Jehovah saves. So what he's saying is that, and, and he even said these words, he says, he came unto his own, but his own received him not, as if Joseph naming Jesus, the name Jesus, was not receiving Emmanuel or God with us. Now, here's what he used. He used Matthew chapter 1. And he started reading in verse number 22. Let's, let's look at verse number 22. Verse number 22 says, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now, verses 22 and verses 23, or verses 20, verse 23 really is a quote from the Old Testament. Okay? What he said this was, was the angel telling Joseph and Mary that his name was going to be called Emmanuel. And then if you keep reading, it says in verse 24, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So he's saying, see, Joseph just decided to call him Jesus. As if that wasn't supposed to be his name, and just because of Joseph's lack of faith, that all of a sudden now we have this name of Jesus. Calling Jesus, you know, how ignorant of Scripture do you have to be to say that, Oh, that wasn't really intended to be his name, Jesus. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. I mean, you could go on and on and on about the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His name is the name that's above all names. The name is important. The name of Jesus Christ and going to try to say that Jesus really shouldn't have even been his name is blasphemy. I'm sorry, he's blaspheming the name of Jesus Christ. But here's how he handled it deceitfully because he's trying to teach this doctrine. But if you go back one verse, one verse, you can see easily how stupid his false blasphemous doctrine is. Look at verse number 21. Actually, let's start reading in verse 20. But while he thought on these things, this is Joseph deciding whether or not he wanted to put away his wife. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. This angel is speaking to Joseph, saying, don't worry about it. Don't, you know, she wasn't unfaithful to you. 
That which is in, conceived in her, in, in her is of the Holy Ghost, verse 21, and she shall bring forth a son, this is what's going to happen, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That was the command from the angel. You're going to call his name Jesus. And then it goes on to say that this is done to fulfill the prophecy that said that a virgin was going to bring forth a son and it should be called his name Emmanuel. Calling his name Jesus and the virgin giving birth fulfilled the prophecy that was given in the Old Testament. But the angel directed him to call his name Jesus. He didn't just make that up on his own. And see, when I saw that, I was like, wow, what a, what a devil who's using the word of God deceitfully to confuse people, to blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ, and to, and to intentionally lead people astray into his weird, bizarre, false doctrine. Why would you leave out that previous verse? You know what he's relying on? He's relying on the ignorance of the people sitting in the pews. He's super lifted up with pride and he thinks that these people are so stupid he can pull anything past them. And you know what? A lot of people eat it up. Say amen. Because they don't know their Bibles and they're, and they're willing to sit there and take this, this false prophet. I have no qualm saying he's a false prophet. Blaspheme the name of their Savior. And this is not some minor, I mean, the name of Jesus Christ is an important issue. This is not just some minor thing. Because look, independent Baptists, we should be independent. You should have all of your, you know, you have your own beliefs. We have our beliefs. You know, we don't have to be yoked up with anyone else's beliefs. And people are going to have differences of opinion, differences in their beliefs. But the name of Jesus Christ is pretty foundational. It's very, I mean, it's our Savior. Like, I mean, it's, it's as foundational as salvation itself. And when the false prophets make themselves known, they need to be called out for what they are. And that, I mean, that's, watch out for the people that just are using God's words completely out of context or not giving you the context. And you know, honestly, this is why when we, if you've noticed, if you've come in here for a little while, we read the entire chapter of the, the basically pretty much the starting point of, of the sermon, which usually has the theme of, of what is going on in the sermon, so that you can get in context the verses that we're going to start reading from to see what's going on in this chapter. So I'm not just trying to throw things at you without having any idea what's going on in that chapter. We read the whole thing. And then we dig in and start show, you know, like, hey, this is, you know, you saw the whole thing in context. And I encourage you to take notes here, write down, because we don't read every single chapter, every, you know, there was not enough time for that. So I jump to places that are pertinent, you know, the pertinent places to, to prove what it is I'm trying to teach. But you should be writing down those references and take it home and look it up later and decide, is what he said in support of what he was teaching, was he taking that out of context? Or does it line up with what, with, with, the, with the context, with, with what the Bible's saying? That is your job to do that. I'm going to do my best to try to teach you the right things. Your job is to judge those things. And we need more people judging all the things that are being taught. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to find the false prophets and spot them and not be deceived by them when you're doing the work on your own. But it's work. Another thing that, that the false prophets will do is drone on and on without teaching clearly. Now this guy in this sermon, we call it, if you want to call it that, a sermon, he spake for almost, for, no, for at least two hours. Now you guys ought to be thankful. I, I do not <laughs> stand up here. I mean, I, I may be a little, a little you know, heavy-winded sometimes, but I mean, you're typically sitting through about an hour's worth of preaching. He was going on and on and on for two hours. And you know what that does, though? I mean, it's one thing if someone's easy to listen to and they're doing a really good job of explaining. 
and, and the time's going by real quick because they're just giving you a lot of good information and making things real clear. You're saying it. That's not what this guy was doing at all. And unfortunately, that, that happens a lot of churches. People, you know, people's eyes start glassing over. You know, your mind starts to wander. As I was listening to this guy's sermon, this is what happened to me. I was like, I was listening to this. I was doing work. You know, I'm, I'm working on my computer and doing other stuff. And I'm listening to this. And then I just start drifting off. Like, what is this guy talking about? One of the things that he did, and, and this is, I mean, this is just kind of funny. All right, you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> Do you remember what the chapter was? It doesn't matter. He went, he went to some chapter and he says, you know, some things just stick out at you when you're reading the Bible. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, some things stick out at you. And he says, well, uh, you know, he, he went to this chapter, I don't remember what chapter it was, and he started pointing out all the S words, just words that started with the letter S. And he started writing them down and writing them down. And he went through the chapter and for almost like 10 minutes, he's writing out all these S words. And then he says, I mean, think about 10 minutes of just, there's this word, oh, your Savior, okay, uh, this and this, and this, you know, and just, just writing down words, just words that start with the letter S. So you know what all this means? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this is like 10 minutes, like, I don't know what this means. And then he just relates it to his own, you know, like, S, like, Sam, like, and he uses his own name, like, and I think, I don't know for sure, he might have read something about, like, like, giving a, a love offering or something for, for Sam, you know, maybe you should get, you know, and it's ha-ha, joke, joke, but his mind is on him just, you know, and, and you notice if you, you know, listen to these guys and, and the, the false prophets are good at this, making jokes about them receiving money. So that sounds like they're just real humble. Oh yeah, this is just real funny. Oh ha-ha, yeah, so I can get some more money. But they keep on like planting that in your head because they don't care about you. They're preaching for filthy lucre's sake. And that's what they really care about. Which is another, which I'm going to get to the greed a little bit later, but that's another sign of the false prophet, the, the person that just cares about the money. But So he goes through this whole thing and he's like wearing you down. I mean, it really is like a weariness sometimes to listen to these guys talk and talk. Because look, when you go to church, and I know it's like coming to church, you want to learn something. You know, you go there because you're trying to listen and you're following a person, make their points. Say, okay, and you try to follow. Be careful when you just get completely lost. So what is this guy talking about? And he goes off on all these rabbit trails. And then just eventually a conclusion is made, but the actual support is lacking. And you didn't quite catch it because you couldn't follow it. And then you just assume, what happens a lot of times people just assume, well, he must have proved the point because he was talking for so long and I just kind of spaced out and I missed it. And a lot of people get suckered in that way. I mean, think about it. You're sitting there, you're trying to focus and pay attention. Like, what's this guy listening? You're talking about, and he goes off on these rabbit trails and trying to think of like, well, why did he start off here? And now he's talking about this and then he's coming back over here. Like, what, where is he going? You try to connect the dots in your mind, try to think like, what is he talking about? And then at the very end, you know, he, he makes a conclusion without even proving it because what he was talking about had nothing to do with the ultimate conclusion and you're kind of confused but a lot of times people just, they're in that same mind, just kind of accept it like, okay, well, whatever and he moves on and it's just slowly people will receive if you keep hearing that teaching over and over again that, well, and, I mean, that must be right because you know, I just don't get it. I'm just not smart enough or whatever. You know, and people doubt themselves instead of questioning, no, what, I mean, what is he trying to say? You got to prove it to me in order for me to believe something. Turn, if you would, to um, Psalm 5. Psalm 5. We're going to look at another, um, another attribute of the false prophet is someone who's a flatterer. A flatterer, someone who uses extensive praise to people and you, you butter them up to make them feel real good and like you're their friend and they, they build that, you build that trust with them or they build that trust with you because they're praising you so much. But the Bible says, to, I mean, all throughout the book of Proverbs, watch out for the person who flatters with their mouth. 
because they're setting a trap for you. That's what it is. Just like you could set traps, you could set bait for, for pests, for insects, for animals, whatever. You put something in the trap that they really like to attract them, right? Something sweet like honey, and then the snare closes on, on whatever it is you're trying to catch. You trap them. And that's, the, that's exactly how flattery works. You're in Psalm 5, look at verse number 8. The Bible says, Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. It, this is talking about the false prophet. This is talking about the person who's this wicked person. It says their inward part is very wickedness, like to their core. They are a wicked person. Their throat's an open sepulcher. It says they flatter with their tongue. This is what the false prophet does. They flatter. They want, they want to make you feel really good so that you, you like them. You feel like they're, you're their friend. Turn if you go to Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26, verse 24, the Bible reads, He that hateth dissembleth with his lips, and layeth up deceit within him. When he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart, whose hatred is covered by deceit. His wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. So those first three verses there, he's dissembling with his lips. He's breaking people down, tearing things apart, and he, he has deceit laid up within him. I mean, he's got lies and deceit in his heart. It says when he speaks fair, so when he speaks something that, that sounds good or fair or right, he said, don't believe him because there's seven abominations already hidden in his heart. That one thing, that one little bit of honey he's trying to give you, he's like, don't, don't fall for that because his heart is full of wickedness and abomination. Verse 26, it says, whose hatred is covered by deceit. He's covering up his hatred for you, right? The, the, the wolf that's out to seek and destroy, he's going to cover that up. He doesn't want you to know and become aware that he's there to destroy. So he's going to cover up his hatred by deceit, by lying. I say, oh no, I love you, brother. His wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. So it says that the person who's, who's lying, they got the lying tongue, they hate you. If someone's lying to you, they hate you. Because if you love someone, you're going to tell them the truth. But the person that hates you is going to lie to you. Yeah. They don't care about you. Why would you lie to someone? I mean, there's no, good in, there's no value in lying to people. It says, The lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. A person dropping all the flattery, because you know what they're doing? They're covering up their hatred with flattery. It's, it, it, it's, it's something you have to be aware of, and it's something you have to look out for. People that just, and, and you know, flattery, I've got, I, I preach an entire sermon about flattery, but it's overdoing it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with complimenting people. And you can't just assume like, oh man, you complimented me, are you a false prophet, right? I mean, we're not on a witch hunt here. But we're trying to identify when our people, when are these things adding up? You know, this person's lying a lot. They're using the word of God deceitfully. They're using all this flattery and trying to butter people up and tell them how great they are, just, just way over and above. They're setting a trap for you. Turn if you go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I quoted this verse earlier, but I'll, I'll read the, the, the reference for you. It's in 1 John chapter 2. Starting in verse 18, the Bible reads, Little children is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. These antichrists are going out from, I mean, and this is talking about the apostle, this is the apostle John saying these people, there's many antichrists out there right now at the time that he was writing his epistle. He says, they came out from us. You think, oh, where did you guys, 
Where did you study? Who were you taught by? The Apostle John? The Apostle Peter? Right? Those are some pretty good names to, to be able to say, yeah, this is where we came from. And people just want to just believe them because they came out from that group. Right? And that's how you're able to draw people after them. This is the crowd I was in. This is the church I went to. I went to the first Baptist of Antioch or whatever, right? I mean, the, 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 the Christian church at, at Antioch or at Berea or at Thessalonica came out of these churches. He says, they came out, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt, no doubt, have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So, and the reason why they left and started their own church or doing whatever they're doing is because it, it, that it might be made known. Because eventually it becomes known. The wolf that creeps in, they only stay undercover for a period of time before they finally let themselves be known. You know, the Bible says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It's going to come out. They could lie for a while. They could use deceit. They could try to trick people. And this is what they'll do. And this is also the same wicked people that'll come in and try to split up churches. They'll try to deceive people and use flattery and then start carrying people away after their false doctrines. And when they get enough people following them, as opposed to the pastor or whatever, then they'll, they'll you know, finally be made known and things will come to a head. And then these, these great churches oftentimes will end up splitting because an infiltrator came in that's out to destroy. And that's, how, that's exactly how the false prophets operate. Um, so Galatians chapter 2, another thing to watch out for, and this is just in general, um, this is not something that you should ever rely on and shouldn't, I mean, shouldn't mean anything to you. It doesn't mean anything to me. But people rely on like, or continually reference education and degrees and where did you go to Bible college and all this other stuff as if that matters, right? I mean, when you're having a conversation with someone about the truth, about the Bible, who cares where you studied? It's irrelevant to the discussion of if a doctrine is true or not. It doesn't matter. People only do that to lift themselves up. So people who always say, oh, I'm Dr. So-and-so, and I've got this PhD, and I'm a master of theology and a master of divinity, and you know, I have all these degrees after my name, which is why you should listen to me. A lot of these guys are fools. You're Dr. James White. Oh, yeah, he's real scholarly and real educated. The guy's a fool. He's not even saved. Galatians chapter 2, look at verse number 3. The Bible talks about this very thing. This... this subject of, of relying on degrees and, and letters of commendation. Look at verse number three. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. So right away, he's talking about people who, and, and the background for the story is that Titus was a Greek. He was not circumcised. But these false brethren, people who did not believe in salvation by grace through faith, but they believed in a works-based salvation, they said, nope, nope, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to keep the law, you've got to do this other stuff. They crept in privately. They didn't make known exactly what they believed. And they, they wanted to spy out, it says, spy out our liberty. We have liberty in Jesus Christ. We're free from the law, right? Our salvation is by faith through grace alone. They came in to spy our liberty that they might bring us into bondage, get it back into doing a workspace salvation, trying to corrupt the gospel. That was their goal. Verse number five, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So he's saying we didn't give place or be subjected to these people not for an hour. When they brought in their damnable heresy and tried to say that, oh, you need to be circumcised, all this stuff, he didn't go along with it. He said, no, we stood up for them. We didn't give place unto them, not even for an hour. We didn't give them any room because they're bringing in damnable heresies. We're not going to tolerate it. And then look what he says in verse 6. But of those who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. He's talking about people who are 
oh, they're supposed to be these real big people, right? These real big names and, and people that, that or he said, they didn't add anything to me in conference. I already know the truth. I don't need anyone else to approve what I believe about God's word because God doesn't accept any man's person. He doesn't care if you've got letters after your name. God doesn't have respect unto you because of some degree that you hold. God cares about the truth Amen. and ministers of the truth and people aren't afraid to preach his word and not corrupt it and not use his word deceitfully and not bring people under bondage. 24 to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 is mentioned one more time. It's even more clear here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. You don't impress me with how many degrees. You really don't. It doesn't impress me. I'm way more impressed with the person who reads and studies their Bible all the time and knows their Bible and I can have a conversation with them and they, they know exactly what I'm talking about and I know what they're talking about because it's someone who reads their Bible and understands doctrine and understands scripture. I've got a lot of respect for that person, way more than the person who they've got a lot of degrees but can't even understand some of the simplest of concepts out of scripture and are just have all kinds of false doctrines and false beliefs because they spend all their time studying what some other guy wrote about the Bible in a book instead of just studying the Bible itself. Now look, you want to read books by other authors, go right ahead. But that shouldn't be the majority of, of where you're getting your learning and teaching from about God's Word. It should be coming from the Bible itself. I'm not going to say it's a sin to read some book that someone wrote about the Bible. Because it's not. But these, these guys that exalt their education and want to rely on that, they're relying on what they've read about all these, from all these other people's opinions. And usually know very little about the Bible itself because they don't spend their time reading the Bible. They spend their time reading every other book under the sun. And that's going to screw you up. Because they're, they're ultimately going to be relying on what some man thinks about the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse number 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Look, there's many people out there corrupting God's word. There were in that time, and there, were today, there are today. False prophets that are out there corrupting God's word. He says, we're not like them. We're not as many which corrupt the word of God. But as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Saying, do we need to like prove ourselves with some letters from some men saying, here, look, we're approved by these people, so this is why you should listen to us? It's interesting. Look, I, I didn't go to Bible college. I know, it's a shocker, right? I don't see Bible college in the Bible. I don't see that the requirements for an elder, for, for a bishop, right? That says you have to attend a certain Bible college. And the church I went to believed the same exact way. I see people in the Bible being taught and trained and, 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 and learning the word of God and, and um, receiving the doctrines and studying to show themselves approved unto God and being workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. And I see those types of examples being set forth, but I don't see a Bible college. That's right. Look, you want to go to Bible college, go right ahead. Again, I, I mean, I don't have a problem with you going there. It really doesn't matter to me if you, if you want to do that. That's fine. But people started coming up with their own standards. And, and, and some of the, I've had, I've had some people I could tell in her voice, kind of speak, with me, speak to me with a little bit of disdain when they find out, oh, you didn't go to Bible college? As if, well, now I'm not going to listen to anything you have to say. I mean, it doesn't matter the amount of time that was spent studying, studying God's word, learning good doctrine, you know, and doing all the work, which everything that the Bible talks about, it's just, oh, you didn't go to Bible college, so you don't have this letter of commendation from this organization somewhere else outside of your local church teaching you something other than what your church believes because that's a biblical model apostle paul says look we're not like other people 
do we need to commend ourselves? Look, do I need to lift up myself and give you all the reasons why you need to believe me? And you go, oh, look, this is why you should believe me because I've got this degree and this degree and this degree. And, you know, no. Believe me because if what I'm saying is true from God's word, that's why you should believe me. I mean, judge for yourselves. The proof should be in the pudding. Amen. You should be able to judge this ministry based on the work that this ministry is doing, based on the things that are happening in this church, based on the people in this church, the people that have been won to Christ through this church. And, and just the fruits of this church. Right. Some degree on a wall means nothing. Amen. You get a degree and not even remember or know anything. Any, I mean, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it really means nothing. And, and the Bible says right here in 2 Corinthians 3, look, you don't need letters of commendation. Verse number two, he says, that, oh, um, you know what, I, I forgot. I, I started reading in chapter two, verse 17, and then continued into chapter three. So if you weren't able to follow me, I apologize for that. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse number two, he says, ye are our epistle written in our hearts, know and read of all men. He's saying, we don't need these letters of commendation from other people because you, you are converts, you are church, you are our epistle. You demonstrate what we believe in, who we are, and, and of what spirit we are and everything else. You are the ones. If people want to know whether or not you know, they can listen to us, you're, you're the, our example. Verse number three, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart, and such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So, the people that want to exalt themselves and how many, you know, watch out for that. And again, you could have one of these attributes and not be a false prophet, right? So I'm just giving you a list of things. Look, when they start adding up, you really better, and some are more severe than others. People can fall into this trap of, of thinking that, you know, of just being proud and thinking that they're really intelligent and that you need to listen to them because you've studied so much or whatever and you have these degrees. It doesn't necessarily make them a false prophet, but keep an eye on all that stuff and don't get sucked into that of, of saying, well, that, that needs to be, you know, you need to have that or else I'm not going to listen to you. Turn if you go to Matthew chapter 7. I need to wrap this up. I didn't realize how. Matthew chapter 7. It's a passage that is, I think, commonly misunderstood. Matthew chapter 7, we're going to read the section starting in verse 15, but it's talking about, you know, by their fruits you shall know them. And too often times people will apply this to just knowing whether or not a person's saved. And what they'll do is they'll say, well, if a person isn't reading their Bible and they drink or whatever, then they must not be saved because the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. Because they're not doing anything good, right? And that's not necessarily true. Because that's not what this passage is talking about, Matthew chapter 7. It's not what the fruit is referring to of just some person of whether or not they're a believer based on how much sin they have in their life. That is not what this is talking about. Let's look at it, though, and we'll read it in context and see what it is talking about. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse number 15, the Bible says, Beware of false prophets. He's setting the stage here, and again, go later and read this whole passage in, in, in context. We're starting in verse 15. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. That's the warning. Look, we've got to beware of these people. Verse 16, Ye shall know them... By their fruits. Who? Who are we just talking about? The false prophet. That's who you identify by their fruits. The false prophet. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. And that concludes this whole section just about 
knowing, knowing a person by their fruits. It's a false prophet. Now look, every believer is not necessarily a prophet, right? A prophet is a smaller subset. So he's saying you're going to know the false prophets by their fruits. And he goes on with a real simple analogy of a tree. If you have a tree, you're going to know what type of tree it is by what fruit it produces. So if you have a tree and it's producing apples, well, guess what? You know what type of tree it is. It's an apple tree because it's producing apples. You're not going to have an apple tree that's producing oranges. You say, no, no, that's really an apple tree. But it, but it just produces oranges. That's not an apple tree. It's an orange tree. I mean, this is simple, right? I mean, this is what he's saying. Like, this is so easy to understand. And he's saying you cannot, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit just as much as a corrupt tree or a bad tree can't bring forth good fruit. You are going to bring forth, everything brings forth after its kind, what type it is. So whatever type of tree it is, that's what's going to bring forth. Not every believer is a tree. Not every believer reproduces himself, Right? Just like not every piece of fruit becomes another tree reproducing itself. You could have a lot of fruit on a tree, but how many of those tree, uh, fruit actually fall to the ground, die, and, grow, and, and you know, turn into another tree bearing fruit? Not many. It's a small percentage. Well, it's the same way with believers, with people who hear the gospel, they believe the gospel, Many people get saved, but they never bring forth more fruit and, and get other people saved and reproduce themselves in other people. Reproduce that, that salvation in another person. Bring forth another Christian. Because if you're a Christian tree, you're going to bring forth other Christians. The false prophet cannot get someone else saved. They're converts aren't going to be legitimate converts that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because they're a false prophet because they don't believe in the doctrine. They're going to be teaching damnable heresies so their converts, their proselytes, as Jesus said, they're going to be twofold more the child of hell than themselves. They're bringing people in and, and bringing them into their own damnation. So if you're going to find who's a false prophet, you look at their converts. You look at what they're doing. You look at the fruits of their ministry. What are they doing? That's how you determine whether or not a, a person, it's one of the, a very good way of determining, is this person a false teacher or not? Are they a false prophet? If you go to a big church, or any church, it doesn't matter what size it is, and you hear someone and he sounds pretty good, go to the people in the congregation and find out, hey, you know, oh, did this person lead you to the Lord? Ask them about their salvation. Ask them what they believe. And you'll see the fruit of that prophet. Is it good fruit or bad fruit? I mean, are all these people just unsaved? Believing in works-based salvation that are supposedly converted by the, by the prophet? That's how you're going to know. It's, it's, very, it's a very simple illustration, but unfortunately it's been, it's been kind of yanked out of context to apply it to way too many people for the wrong reasons than, than it should be. All right, I need to, let's turn if you would to 2 Peter 2. I'm going to close with that. I've got some more things I wanted to cover. Someone who's greedy is another good sign, and I mentioned that before. I'm not going to cover that. It's pretty, it's pretty simple to understand. I was going to show you some passages from Jude and um, talking about people who, you know, the false prophets who ran greedily after the heir of Balaam and people who are just in it for the money. You know, th those are false, false prophets, just care about the money. Um, but 2 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 1. We're going to close with this and we'll be done. The Bible says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. This is something that's going to happen, which is why I'm preaching this. We need to understand this. There's, there's going to be false teachers among us. It's going to happen. And we can't stop it from it. I mean, it's going to happen. They're going to creep in. They're going to they're they're sneak in. It says who privily, which means like privately, sneakily, 
shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. This is why Peter is giving the admonition. He's saying, look, there's gonna be false prophets and watch out for it. And he's gonna explain and describe them. Verse number two, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. These people will come in privately and bring in their damnable heresies and they're going to try to gain your confidence through many different ways. They're going to try to gain your confidence through flattery. They're going to try to gain your confidence through things like, oh yeah, I'm King James only. Oh yeah, look at my material on that. And I can't tell you how many false prophets I've seen that promote a King James only. I mean, Peter Ruckman comes to mind. He has a lot of material out there on, on the King James Bible issue that a lot of people refer to. But then you start getting into his weird doctrines on other things, like, like a child isn't even really like a person or alive until they breathe their first breath. So like opening the door for, for abortions to be just fine because they don't believe that life actually begins at conception. But when you breathe in, you know, weird things like that. I mean, just bizarre, damnable doctrines. But they use something that, oh yeah, hey, we, you know, we've got a connection here. We believe that and, and we'll, we'll sneak in and, and then start spewing their, their damnable heresies. Look at, uh, jump down to verse number 10. The Bible says, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh and lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. These are, this is the false prophet. These are, this is the attributes of them. They walk after the flesh and lust of uncleanness. They despise government. And not just like the government here, but I mean like governing, a, you know, like God or, or anyone ruling over them at all. Just despising any government at all. Presumptuous are they self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring that railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these as natural brute beasts. It's talking to these about these false prophets as being natural brute beasts, stupid animals, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not. They can't understand them. They're not saved. They're damned. They're children of the devil and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Again, the admonishment, while they're with you, they're going to be feasting with you. To be going to the potluck with you and, and making themselves look like a sheep, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. Verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Now I'm going to go on a little bit, but we need to remember, and, and, and I'm constantly trying to, to remind everyone here of this because I believe everyone here is pretty normal in the sense that your eyes aren't just full of adultery and you can't cease from sin ever. That this isn't you just, just out to beguile unstable souls and just have hatred in your heart and, and, and are just mischievous and, and, and trying to seek people's hurt and just are constantly, constantly in the flesh and just, and just can't stop from sinning. This is a wicked, wicked person that is hard to even comprehend that these people exist because it's so far removed from who you are, right? And like I said before, this isn't just your average unsaved person. I mean, I know when I was unsaved, was I wicked? Yeah. Was I a sinner? Yeah, of course. But was I just constantly just bent on people's destruction? No. I mean, I wasn't like, you know, like the serial killers, right? I mean, if people are just plotting and planning and, and, premeditating their murder and hurting people and killing people and just going after them and setting traps. I mean, this is the way that a false prophet is described as being. They try to make themselves look real good. And oftentimes the serial killers, they get by with doing this stuff for a really long time because they fool a lot of people into thinking that they're good, that they're just fine, that there's nothing wrong with them. Well, this so-and-so would never do that. Just like the child molesters. Uncle so-and-so would never do anything like that. Cousin so you know, whoever it is. They would never do that. How dare you say anything against them? Because they've, they've built up their confidence with you. But we need to be aware of this. 
that these people do exist so that we're vigilant and we watch out for it so that they, we don't allow them just to destroy our church, destroy your life, destroy your children's lives, and, and protect yourself from it. Verse 15, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb mass speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great, sp excuse me, sw swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. The false prophet is someone we need to seriously be on guard for all the time. And in the days of the internet, it's so much easier for, to get, to get, for false prophets to gain access. Because you may very sincerely be looking for some more teaching, looking, you know, I want to hear some good preaching. Look, that's great. Amen. But just be careful about who you're listening to and try to prove them. It's a lot harder to prove someone on their fruits when all you hear is a sermon on the internet. And I'll close with that point because, you know, anybody can listen to stuff and promote teachings online and be a follower of whoever. But that doesn't necessarily make that person the fruit of that person's ministry, right? There's a lot of people who believe all kinds of weird things that will follow and do all kinds of nasty things on the internet, even though they're following someone who teaches right, and they're bringing a bad name upon that person, but that's not their fruit. I mean, that's just, these are just people doing what they do on the internet because the internet's like the Wild West. I mean, who knows where, 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 their true you know, where their true leanings are coming from. So all that said, just to, to read your Bibles, just to say this, read your Bibles, watch out for the warning signs, the Bible says in Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Let's not be simple. Let's be, let, let's be educated. Know your Bible. Watch out for the liars. Watch out for the, for the, for the flatterers. Watch out for the people who are constantly worried about their degrees and trying to tell you why you should believe them. Watch out for the people who are greedy and just, they seem like they're just in it for the money. They're always talking about tithing. They're always talking about how much money you got to give. They're always, you know, they're all so focused on the money. And not the weightier manners of the law and judgment and, and mercy and, and, and you know, all the things that the Bible talks about here. So hopefully, you know, you could use this information. Don't forget it. Don't, you know, don't get lulled into, a, into a, um, a state where you're just accepting of everything that comes your way. Constantly judge, constantly be aware, and, and be on the lookout for those that are lying in wait to deceive. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the instructions that you give us in your word. God, um, this, is a, this, is, this particular topic I know has been stressed over and over again. We, could, we see it clearly um, even with the Apostle Paul, you know, talking about how he's, how he's spent night and day just warning and, and um, knowing that, that at his departure that, that the wolves are going to come in, dear Lord. Jesus Christ himself even said that, that he was gonna, when he was going to go away, there's going to be people that are going to come in and try to scatter the flock, dear Lord. Uh, we know that these people exist. We know that there's evil, wicked people out there. Help us never to forget that and to be on guard and not to just be super judgmental of everybody all the time, in the sense of, of like being on some type of a witch hunt, dear God, because that's not what, what the atmosphere we're trying to create here. But just to be aware and just to, just to be cautious and always uh, be on the lookout just to make sure that what we are receiving is in fact truth and is coming from your word, dear Lord, and not just even the thoughts out of someone's heart. Um, I pray that you would please just help us and, and help our church to grow and that we wouldn't be split by some false brethren that creep in unawares, dear Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray, amen.